We're going to jump in at Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11 this morning. You can see the address right here on the screen. Exodus 20, uh, beginning at verse 8. You know these verses most likely. Uh, maybe they're a little unfamiliar to you, but this is um, part of the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, when God scribed uh, the Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone and gave them to Moses, and he gave them to the people uh, during the Exodus so that they might know how to be in a relationship with the one true God versus uh, the polytheism and the, and the wandering and wandering that they would experience not only when they were enslaved in Egypt, but as they migrated through the desert. And uh, you know what happened in the desert. Um, for all the days of their disobedience, they had to spend a year in the desert. That's why they were there for 40 years before entering the rest of the promised land. The law is given in that context. So it's a pretty amazing thing. Uh, today we get to talk about the fourth commandment, uh, the, the last command on the first table of the law about our relationship with God. And the question is, what's our Abba Father's reason for making the Sabbath day holy? We're going to address that today. And to get us ready for the word of the Lord, um, Isaiah 58 is our prayer text this morning. Uh, the scripture reads, If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord and I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. What a great passage for the people of the Lord. Let's start with prayer. God, I am delighted in your gift of rest. I'm doing it your way, not mine. I long to find my joy in you alone. I want a triumphant life to feast on the gift of the inheritance of righteousness in Christ and fellowship with the one true God dwelling in safety and peace. I want it so bad I can taste it. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord. Send your Holy Spirit now to be our teacher, to translate the truth and the power of your word into our hearts and minds that we might be motivated by love. Help us to remember those words that are from you, to forget the ones that are not. And we pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. So verse 8, let's just put verse 8 up on the, up on the screen. Uh, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. We know it as the fourth commandment. So let's have fun for a little bit. All right? Um, who wants to have fun on the Sabbath? Say yes. Uh, most of you, some of you, you're, you're not sure yet. You were raised here and it's not true Sabbath if it doesn't hurt or feel bad, right? Okay, um, I ain't lying. Uh, so uh, let's make a quick list of uh, what are some things you're not allowed to do on the Sabbath day? Go, <laughs> go swimming, uh, but you can and you don't get your hair wet. Yeah, I, I got you, I got you, right? It's like, I was only doing 70, officer, not 74. Yeah, uh, oh, I get it. All right, well, <laughs> I'm just being silly. What are the, some, some of the things you should do on the Sabbath? Rest, what else? Go to church, yes. Enjoy your family, what else? Watch football and read your Bible. And today those things can be simultaneously, both on an app. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what else? Night church. What's that? <laughs> right, what's that? Yeah. So this is not church. This is a building in which the church meets. I am the church. You are the church. I am alive at night. We have night church. It's the Socratic method for winning every argument. So play with me. Maybe you can see this on the screen. Maybe not. Uh, let's see. What, what do we got here? This is how, finish the word for me. Most of us grew up with Sabbath. What's the word? Don't. Oh, no. Don't. Is that with an apostrophe? It is, yes. Do not. Is it in the right place, the apostrophe? Okay. I was only good at math. I was not good at spelling. So this whole thing of like Google shared docs is an activity of humility every day for me. Uh, pardon? Yes, Grammarly is good. Um, leave the camera on the sign. I just have to get my eraser. I want to change the way we think about Sabbath today. I want to help us through the scripture 
uh, open our hearts to the heart of God. Um, I grew up uh, in Southern California. I'm, I turned 60 on my last, last birthday, so you can imagine what Sundays were like, right? We were allowed to swim, and we got our hair wet. Uh, we did, but imagine how the New Testament and T changed things. Let's, let's do it this way. Let's think of it differently, okay? If you would like to see the Sabbath day a little bit different, a lot a bit better, say, yes, I do. Today we're going to look at the will of the Lord, the heart of Sabbath in the fourth commandment. Um, and you know some of those places uh, where it shows up in Scripture, where there are some restrictions, but there are plenty of observations and potential for us to live into the pattern that God designed. Um, but talking about Sabbath can be difficult. I want to make it fun, but it can be difficult because everyone sees it differently. We get nervous when we talk about restrictions. Was it last week that I talked about not going to Meyer, but once in a while to Aldi? Um, I don't really do either. That was just fun. I was having fun with you. Um, but there, there are times where we get into that space of what you do that on, on the Sunday and you do that. Well, I don't. You know what I'm talking about? And so somehow we get this pharisaical arrogance and our ego blows up a little bit and we can hardly, well, that's why there's a double door at the front of the worship center. Uh, we can hardly fit. You know, where it talks about work, uh, what makes work something to, uh, to one person, um, but it's restful or restorative to another person. You know, why is it that I don't pull weeds on a Sunday, but there are some people who they sit in their front yard and they pull up those milkweeds because they find restoration and peace and quiet in that. And, and what is rest on a Sunday? Is, is it recreation? Is that what rest is? Is recreation? Or, or is it travel? Or is it watching football or golf? Um, and if you're looking to get a nap on a Sunday, I have some old sermon tapes I can hand out afterwards. You know that four hours of sinlessness that some people call a Sunday nap? Um, or is it on which day of the week that you observe the Sabbath? The law says the seventh day. This is the first day of the week. The New Testament church gathered on the first day because it's the day of resurrection, the day of Pentecost. Does it matter to God? I mean, is freedom holy or must it hurt? to keep the Sabbath, right? Um, I was a youth pastor till I was 38. And, um, and I remember the rhythm that I had on a Sabbath, and my students kept that same rhythm. Uh, we would show up for worship, and then we would have Sunday school or catechism classes, and then we would go home and eat something out of the time-baked oven, and then there would be choir rehearsal, and then night church, and then student ministries youth group, yes? And we ended up not liking Sabbath because we hit Monday morning exhausted. That's the way it was. But yet the scripture says to delight in it. But if our heart's not right, we despise it instead. What's up with all this? That's what we want to talk about today. How do I live into the delight of the gift of the Sabbath that God has ordained for us? You see, because I think for every hundred people, there are 103 different ideas about how to delight in the day keeping Sabbath in holiness. And we feel anxious when we talk about it like this, right? Like what, maybe somebody even had the expectation today that I would just draw a line down the middle of the, of the whiteboard here and I would give us a list of do's and don'ts. Maybe that would be helpful, I don't know. What does it look like to keep the Sabbath? What is freedom? What is law keeping? I wonder if the law is for the Jews only or why the Seventh Day, and we actually had this here, Seventh Day Adventists, uh, put flyers underneath our windshield wipers telling us we were doing it all wrong and we were in trouble of our salvation because we were breaking the law. We compare and we condemn. We get in that space where we say, well, at least I don't do that. I would never do that. And uh, you got ahead of the manuscript a little bit. Why don't we have night church, right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's just recently that the church order in our own denomination has said that it's optional. Did you know that? Yeah, <laughs> if you didn't hear that, somebody just went, woohoo. <laughs> I figure if I preach for an hour, that's like two, <laughs> right? So we had first service before halftime, second service after. So let's rewind and review a second and see if we can see the fourth commandment apart from our feelings about it, right? 
I mean, it's a good way. It's an objective method of saying, all right, besides uh, differently from how I feel about it or how I was raised, and now we do things different. Uh, I remember my church in Chicago, uh, like student ministries, we would take trips, right? And so we would go visit another church for a retreat or we would be on a mission trip. We were not allowed to drive home on a Sabbath day, on a Sunday. We either had to blast all the way back on a Saturday or stay over all the way till Monday, which didn't work for the volunteers who had to be at their jobs, right? Um, so one mission trip, uh, we were in Louisiana, and it ended Saturday morning, and we blasted all the way back to be home. It's just something, the way that we see it and how we feel about it. So let's see if we can set our feelings aside for a minute and just get a really good objective perspective on what God was doing. Here is the full reading of the fourth commandment from Exodus chapter 20, all of the verses 8 to 11. It's on the screen. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, your son, your daughter, uh, neither a male or female servant, nor your animals, or any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The word of the Lord, Exodus chapter 20. The citing of the law in Exodus 20 calls all the way back to creation. God says, do this because I did. We must rest, all of us, our family, our employees, even our strangers, because God rested on the seventh day. It means to rest, means to abandon activity or to remain in a still state of rest. That's what it literally means. And it's interesting to me that he blessed the Sabbath day. That word blessed means to kneel and bless. And it's most often used for when we bless the Lord, right? We kneel before him and give him honor and glory. And God did this to that day. He, he blessed that Sabbath day and made it holy. So there's something sacred about that time. It's an interesting act of God to bless a day because he imbued it with a divine purpose. And he made it holy. It's set apart from other time. It's sanctified and consecrated. Listen closely. This is the whole deal right here. It's sanctified and consecrated to transmit holiness to the participant. There is something special about time that God sets aside. In Exodus 20, God gave the commandment within the context of creation. It's the way he designed creation with a holy rhythm. Six days for work and the seventh for rest from that work. Remember that metric, to rest from work, after work. God didn't need to rest, though, did he? I mean, his energy is limitless. He is God Almighty. It's not that he was exhausted. It's not that he was tired. It was for a different reason that God rested from his labor. It's a setting aside of time as a divine example for us to enjoy the work of creation. This command isn't arbitrary, and it's not simply for the exhausted. God gave it for our health, our life, our rhythms. It even recovers our memories. Keeping Sabbath with rest creates capacity to remember that God is God, that he's the maker of heaven and earth. It's some of the text that was read this morning from, uh, one, in one of our songs from Psalm 121 that the... Um, I look to the hills, from there my help comes. So that we might serve him from a position of blessed, re blessed rest. Imagine one perspective is that we work hard and then rest on the seventh. Another is to rest so that we might work the next week. We rest to work. It's like the CPUs, the central processing units in our minds need to shut down. They need a, a, a reset or a restart. Otherwise, it, it gets all jammed up. The RAM gets jammed and full, and it won't communicate with a hard drive. Have you ever had that with your computer, and it just won't talk, and it just sits there, and then you can't find the cursor, and so you end up having to do a hard shutdown? That's how it is with our brains. Deuteronomy 5, the second giving of the law, the second reading of the law, verse 15, is in a different context for the fourth commandment. God says, as, as Israel has been redeemed and is leaving slavery, he puts it in that context, in those verses. It's on the screen about God, our Redeemer, that he's mighty to save. Verse 15, remember, God says, that you were slaves in Egypt 
and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you, observe the Sabbath day. It's both. God gave this command to a people who were between slavery and the promised land, a redeemed people about to enter a land that they didn't plant, they didn't develop, they didn't steward, and when they moved in, they were going to eat the grain and drink the wine and live in houses they didn't build. And so God says, remember the Sabbath day or you will forget. You'll forget that God saved you and redeemed you. You'll forget God unless there's a cadence of a holy day. It's not about the don't, it's about the do. Sacred time, blessed by God to convey holiness to the participant so that we might remember that he is our creator and our redeemer. Amen? We could be done, but let's talk for a little bit, all right? God says don't forget because he knows we're good forgetters. We need a day of rest to recover capacity to live in holiness, to remember that he is God and we are his beloved. We're his redeemed people. And if we don't pause to remember, we forget a bunch of things. We forget who we are and where we came from, and we begin to get full of ourselves. It's a package deal. You see, we can't understand this command apart from the others we've already looked at. God says he is our God, the one true God, our creator and redeemer, so worship him only. He's to be reverenced and worshiped, not in idolatry. And when we use his names, as he gives us instructions on how to do that, how to prioritize him well, he says, remember, be mindful, call it to attention. That word remember means to take up something that you've thought about and it's way back here and bring it to the forefront so that you see life through it to recall it to our primary attention. That's the word, remember. The fun part about that word is it's a dynamic or relational word. It's not simply that I take a thought and bring it to the forefront of my mind, but that it's we do it. Part of the meaning of that word is to tell it, to say it out loud, to remind others. This is part of the blessed fellowship that you and I experience on a Sunday morning in worship. We're together, and when you sing, and you sing beautifully, it calls out of me praises. You know, I'm not a really good singer, and sometimes when the team up here, they go in places, and there's harmonies, and they hit notes, and they do things that I can't do, it's like being lifted into heaven, into God's glory. It's like I'm in a stadium, and there's 10,000 people singing praises to God, and I'm lifted up. Can I get an amen? You know that? That's part of the blessing of fellowship on a Sabbath day. We help each other remember when I see you and how good God has been to you, I know how good he is. What we know so far is that God commanded Sabbath rest so that we would live a life with capacity to remember that he's our God, the God who redeemed us from slavery and slavery to sin and its death penalty, to have no other gods and reverence his name, Sabbath rest is also a position from which we learn to love each other well. That's the next table of the law. And I wonder if we can't keep the second table to not harm each other, to not kill each other, hate each other, to steal each other's things or spouses, whatever it is. I wonder if we need to do these things better first so that we can do better at those. That if God is first and we reverence his holiness and we worship him well, how that changes how we live. When we set aside our endeavors to cease our work, our manufacturing, our earning, our livelihood, so that we can remember that God is creator, redeemer, and provider, when we stop our work and enter his rest, it's a confession, it's a testimony, and it gives us mental and spiritual capacity to remember that God is the only only one who can bless our work. Our work will only produce a harvest if God blesses it. Only God can redeem us from the curse that's in the garden, that our work is simply fruitless toil. My paycheck, your paycheck, the fruit of the work of your hands depends on his blessing. That comes out of Sabbath. 
when we celebrate Sabbath, we, we learn that he's the provider. He provides the rain and the sun and the income and all the good things. And we learn that he's the author of spiritual rest and eternal rest because only in Christ is there a rest from the battles and the trials in this sinful life. Only in Christ are we redeemed and we need Sabbath to remember that. That's the whole purpose of the fourth commandment, to learn and remember that his gracious providence and blessed presence is our life, it's our breath, it's our joy and gladness. And when we keep Sabbath, we experience the blessing that he has reserved for that sacred time. It begins to give us an appetite, a longing for eternal Sabbath. It's beyond ironic to me that Sabbath keeping has become so contentious that it's a law that's often just, if it's not disregarded, it's despised. It's nearly unbelievable that we wouldn't want to keep Sabbath so much that we would begin planning for it already on Thursday and live live in its strength until Tuesday and miss it so badly on Wednesday that we start planning again and then we do it again the next week and again and again. That was God's intent. But we messed it up. We trusted other gods who don't take a day. We trusted ourselves and the work of our hands. That's never sufficient. And just as bad, the church leaders in Jesus' day made more rules about how to keep the Sabbath day holy than God did. The Pharisees added some 103 laws of their own to help us keep the fourth commandment. They made it impossible to delight in the day of the Lord. They made God's people hate Sabbath, and it became another drudgery of failure, reminding them how terrible they were. They couldn't do it. They weren't even allowed to spit on a Sabbath because that spit would land on the ground and potentially it would start a seed growing and all of that kind of... It's it's amazing the amount of rules that they established. All with a desire to keep Sabbath. But think God made it more simple when he calls us to do the delight instead of don't do the things that harm us. What was meant to be joy and freedom and restoration, remembering how good God is, became a list of don'ts for us, and and, and we forgot. We forgot the do this part, the love God part, the enter his rest part. In treating the Sabbath like any other day, we've lost the sweetness of Sabbath rest. And into that context, the broken context of God's creation, when Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, when God's people were enslaved in Egypt, and now they're set free, And they receive bread from heaven and water from a rock, a divine blessing in the deserts of life. Into those contexts, Jesus shows up. In the fire, in the water, he's with us. We're never alone. Jesus shows up as the true bread from heaven, the eternal living water, and the Lord of the Sabbath. He shows up just like his father at creation and demonstrates how to keep Sabbath. So let's look. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse 23. It's on the screen. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples walked along. They began to pick some heads of grain, and the Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? It's always ironic to me that, you know, like I joked about last week, if somebody sees you in Meyer, they're in Meyer with you. You're already there. How did the Pharisees know that Jesus was in the grain field picking grain? They had to be on a Sabbath walk too. Anyway, here they all are. The Pharisees said, why are they doing this? Here's his answer, verse 25. Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. Now, there's a whole other message there about the priesthood of David and that lineage that leads into the priesthood of Christ. But Jesus here was speaking about his role and ours as we follow him. And he also gave some to his companions. Verse 27, then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man. It's a gift for you because God knows we need it. Not man for the Sabbath. It's not about rules. It's not about the don'ts. It's about the do. So the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. The Pharisees were accusing Jesus of breaking Sabbath law. And Jesus proclaimed his lordship over the Sabbath as our true priest, the one who would gain our access to God the Father. And at the exact time, he proclaims that not only did he create the Sabbath, but he's the author of how to keep the Sabbath. And this is good news for us because we can look to Jesus and his example for what that is. 
Besides walking further than a Sabbath walk limited by the Pharisees, Jesus was picking grain to feed the hungry. Jesus revealed that Sabbath is about life bringing. It was made for us. It's a gift for us that we might experience life. Rest brings life. I like Matthew's uh, telling of the same story, Matthew chapter 12. According to uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus also spoke these words. I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. They asked him, So, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And he said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to, them, to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees, listen close, Jesus was healing on the Sabbath, but the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. The Sabbath was intended not to burden people, but lift burdens, to bring life and rest, to bring capacity to make laws against acts of mercy and goodness on the Sabbath is contrary to what God intended. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He did what was right. He healed that man. And that's when the Pharisees began to plot to kill him. Are you kidding? It's illegal to heal on the Sabbath, but it's right to plot a murder on the Sabbath? I don't understand, but that's what legalism will do for you. Jesus is life. He's bringing life while the law keepers were bringing death. When we rest in him, we receive the blessing that God reserved for the Sabbath. That we're not saved by the works of our hands, but by faith in Jesus Christ. That Jesus fulfilled all the law because we can't. His righteousness is now ours. We rest in that truth. That although I can't earn God's love, he gives it to me unconditionally. And he accepts me because of Jesus Christ. We rest in that truth. He died and covered our debt. And then he rose and secured our resurrection unto eternal life, the eternal promised land. That's what rest is. It begins in my mind of knowing and believing, experienced in my body in a time of rest that I might have capacity to live my life for God. And if we can get out of our own heads about Sabbath laws and get away from freaking out about rules and instead get into our hearts and become motivated by love, imagine what would change. In John 14, 15, Jesus said it best, when you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It has to start in our heart. Like the prophet Isaiah said, when you delight in the day of the Lord, when you desire that rest, the blessing of God is poured out and every day will be a day of worship when it comes from our heart and not our rule book. Every Sabbath will be a day of delight and we'll experience life and restoration. Imagine if we could imagine Sabbath differently, closer to the reasons that God gave for a holy rest without the fear of breaking rules, and instead see it as his gift to mankind, a gift full of potential to discover the heart of God and the promise of his rest, to be totally lost in the goodness of God instead of the grind of toil, the difficulty in labor of performance and production. What would we actually, I'm sorry, what if we would actually rest like he did after a productive week? What would we begin to notice or understand and see? What would we recover? How would the processor of our mind reboot and repurpose and reprioritize all of our time? This perspective, these questions, comes out of trying to live into Colossians 2, verse 16. Listen to these words. And don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Imagine if the motivation in our heart is love, and nothing we desire is more than him, and we pursue him in holiness the way that he says in rest. How would we change? The Heidelberg Catechism in question and answer 103 outlines a bunch of scriptures, a bunch of them. 
uh, the intentions from Scripture about how to live into Sabbath. I'm just going to ask us the question that it says in, in 103. It's on the screen. What's God's will for us in the fourth commandment? And I'll summarize. First, uh, it's that we gather together. These are the actions. And secondly, it's uh, my attitude. My actions should be to gather together to help us remember and bring life. And I actually have in, uh, in the first uh, manuscript for this, um, uh, for this sermon today, um, there's two pages of just scriptures. So we could, just can't recite them all here. This would need its own series or its own small group and study to go through all those things. So just let me summarize for the reasons for us to gather together and discover life, to gather together that the gospel ministry might be proclaimed, that we might be educated and learn from the word, that we might attend the assembly of God's people and experience a day of rest together, that we might let God's word teach our hearts, experience the sacraments, engage in public prayer, and bring in our offerings. All those are from Scripture. And second, the scripture talks about my attitude that um, are established in true rest. It produces a readiness in my heart when I rest from evil, when I let the Holy Spirit work in me and I pay attention, leaning into God's purposes for my life to get me ready for eternal Sabbath. When I do those things, when my actions promote my attitude, I lean into God better. That's why he said rest. I've made it holy. There's a holy blessing in there, not reserved for other time. It's special time, and I want that for you. Hebrews 4, the book of Hebrews, does a great job of unveiling the purposes of God in the Old Testament and for our salvation in Jesus Christ. Here's one uh, excerpt, uh, Hebrews 4, 9. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall away by following their example of disobedience. How we live life is our testimony. I did a lot of reading to prepare for today. Um, I would say even more than some other Sundays because it's, you know, we grew up with this common law, right? We we know this law and it's familiar to us and so it's easy to misunderstand it. And I I wanted to get at what's God's heart? What's his motivation here? So I read books and articles and and scriptures and pages and pages of perspectives about that. And and here's just some of them. I'm going to quote from Mark Buchanan a little bit. He's been a minister for 40 years and he deals with um, a career that he has to work on Sunday. (laughs) And so how does does he find rest? And then um, Shelley Miller writes Rhythms of Rest about Sabbath for the Busy Worker. Really, really good. And Um, Ruth Haley Barton in Sacred Rhythms, and I'll leave these up here if you want to come and take a peek or take a picture, um, has one chapter on Sabbath in Sacred Rhythms about what it means to have a patterned life that we're intentional about that time. I'm going to invite you to just do that so that the desire in your heart grows. But here's something from Mark Buchanan, a quote on the screen. We're made from dust, and to it we will return. We're like clay pots, which is dust mixed with water, passed through the fire, hard and brittle. And maybe that's why God gave us a Sabbath. One of my favorite chapters in here, Mark writes, um, maybe Sabbath isn't a day. Maybe it's an orientation, a way of seeing life. Sabbath keeping is about mending. If we don't keep Sabbath, we break. Our dustiness consumes us. And like a cracked vessel, we can't hold anything. Our culture isn't going to teach us this. Our culture won't help us to keep Sabbath We see stillness as laziness and rest as sloth. We've confused, listen close, we've confused restoration and recreation. So we fill our day with activities that can't restore us. The gift of God is a way of inviting us to know him more deeply and enter his presence more fully. And maybe that's why he says, be still and know that I'm God. Sometimes we need to stay in one place in order to receive his blessing. Some people grow up legalistic about Sabbath. Some grow up indifferent. Either way, Sabbath can feel like one more thing to do, and none of us needs that. Sabbath is actually an invitation from Jesus. Listen to his words on the screen. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Sabbath is an invitation to a relationship with Jesus. And if we don't take care of ourselves, if we don't find true rest in Christ, our minds will drive us out of our minds. 
Colossians 1, the apostle teaches us our minds can become an enemy towards God. Romans 12 and Ephesians 4 teaches us that we're being transformed by the renewing of our minds and the attitude of our hearts. And in 1 Corinthians 2, 16, we're taught to have the mind of Christ. Sabbath keeping is the key that unlocks the door to becoming Christ-like. It's a part of the peace of Christ that protects our hearts and minds. When we belong to Christ, our mind is changed. I just looked at the clock. It's 11.05. The nursery workers are going to be happy with me, but I got one more page. <laughs> Say yes if you're in for six and a half more minutes. The rest of you just get up. There's coffee in the back. When we belong to Christ, our mind is changed. The, the way we think about life changes. We're no longer the king of our calendars. We're not independent or free to do simply as we please. Remember that from the opening passage? If you just do whatever you want, we remove ourselves from the blessing. Instead of becoming dangerous for the kingdom, we move ourselves into danger. That's what this whole series is about. We have a new Lord. The Lord of the Sabbath is our king. And he invites us to spend the Sabbath in holy rest. And fortunately, he's gracious and kind full of love and slow to anger, and he wants what's best for us. Let's start there. The command to keep Sabbath is what's best for us. Imagine if we don't. Pastor Mark, who wrote this book, uh, he struggles with Sabbath, and he felt it with a lot of guilt when he got his first sabbatical. His people in his church said to him, oh, Pastor Mark, you deserve this. You're working so hard. And he says, I don't deserve this. I'm not a single mom working three jobs. I work 50 hours a week, and that's it. I don't deserve any more time off than I get but it gave him an opportunity to look at his soul. He's a veteran, 40-year pastor. Notes that when he fails to keep Sabbath well, he doesn't. When he doesn't cease his efforts, weeks begin to blend into months of endless good works in confessing that idolatry of work, the idolatry of self. Here's what he said, and it touched my heart. I ended up withered. I spark like dry static when I'm really tired. I get mildly paranoid. I suspect conspiracy. I start to distrust people. I resent interruptions. I stop caring. I become a master of diversion. I get sloppy and cagey and prickly and forgetful. Wow. Anyone else tired and half crazy because you haven't rested? <laughs> not keeping Sabbath is not a good idea. I mean, why do we set that gift aside and work around it instead of opening it? It's there for us. Why are we so busy? What would change about my actions and attitudes if I pursued this gift from God? I'm just going to summarize a couple things that I read. I would gain a better perspective on my work. My mind would be renewed. Uh, I would discover a chance to see what's really missing in my life. I would begin to see the bigness and sovereignty and sufficiency of God. I would understand that God has numbered my days, and I should too, because every one of them is important. In that rest, I would understand more of why God contextualized the law in creation. He rested, and in freedom from slavery, because I can rest in Christ. I would begin to do the math and put those together, knowing that my liberation from sin saves me from the wickedness and insidious sin that's already in my heart. I would be able to rest in the truth of my redemption and begin to gain a holy hatred for the sin in my life. And I would learn to value others better, gathering with the people of God to serve and to worship, and I would learn how to be restored, not simply to recreate, which can be the downfall of many of our weekends. I would learn to eat slow and eat with others and get a sacred foretaste of the heavenly banquet that's coming our way. Imagine how having a new mind from truly engaging Sabbath rest would change the way I spend my time and my money of how I work with other people and the spirit in me about how my, priorita how my priorities and calendar might change. One author says he actually gains more time by resting. I wonder how I would treat forgiveness when I pause to remember that I'm forgiven and that I'm called to forgive others. Imagine how the blessing of Sabbath, all those things that are shalom, joy, health, wholeness, peace, and success. Imagine how the peace of God would allow me to really say, it is well with my soul. Sabbath is the antidote for the curse of painful toil and work that we gained in the garden. Sabbath is God's gift of rest in the middle of distress and trouble. Sabbath is resting in Christ, his greatest gift of all, and that's why he invites us to come to him. 
Let's close with Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle in heart. Our God says he is in gentle in heart and humble, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This gift is for you. It's up to you now if you're going to open it or not. For me, I want what that gift has. Holiness and a renewed mind, a right heart that prioritizes God in my life. Amen. Pray with me. Father God, help me to open the gift of Sabbath, all of it, not just the Sunday morning gathering, not just the open word and opportunity to serve. Help me also to have an increased passion for all the holiness of keeping a Sabbath day, to find rest for my soul, to pause and look up, to pause and look forward toward my eternal rest, to my own resurrection. Father, forgive me for treating Sabbath with indifference or making it optional, like, like I speed on Baldwin Avenue and I don't even think about it because everyone else is too. Instead, restore to me the joy of Sabbath-keeping, to find restoration for my mind and my body, and especially to restore my relationship with you, my Abba Father. You created us. You redeemed us. You are keeping us for the day of the Lord. So help us to keep a Sabbath day for the Lord, to rest in your presence, remember your providence, to be free from guilt and rest in your goodness, to forget the pain of last week and engage the fellowship of believers to spend less time on myself and spend more time with you, Jesus. You know what's best for us. You created us. You know what we need. So thank you for this gift, the freedom and blessing to soak in your presence and to remember that you, the Lamb of God and King of Heaven, came here to redeem what was lost, to recover and restore our souls, to bring us into your rest with peace and gladness. We love you, Jesus. We do. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Will you stand with us?